I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Catherine Zeta-Jones is one of the most beautiful and talented actresses to ever grace the silver screen. Yes, she is a very attractive human being, but it is her charisma, her charm, and her acting skills that shot her straight to the top of Tinseltown. She's an Oscar winner who can sing and dance, and she can hold her own amongst some of cinema's greatest action heroes. Catherine Zeta is no damsel in distress. She's the real deal, a genuine movie starlet, maybe one of the last true remaining classic movie stars. Catherine Zeta-Jones can do it all. She definitely left her mark on the movies. She's got that classic beauty in vain of the golden age of Hollywood. I believe that CZJ, that's what I call her, would have done fine as an actress in any time period. But then one day I thought to myself, I said, self, what the f happened to Catherine Zeta-Jones? She used to be everywhere, and then nothing. Why? Why, I cried, why? Why would the movie gods let such a career fizzle out? Is there any chance of a CZJ comeback? All this and more will be answered at the end of this informative YouTube video. I hope. So stay tuned to find out what the f*** happened to Catherine Zeta-Jones. Oh my gosh! This is too, I mean, my hormones are just too way out of control for me to be dealing with this, but... She was born in Wales, which is news to me. Because I actually always assumed she was Mexican because of... because of Zorro. That's how good she is! She made me believe she's Mexican. And I'm married to a real-life Mexican, so I should know what a real Mexican is, and she... she... she fooled me. But that's a whole other video... that I'll never make. But in her first film ever, she convinced everyone that she was Arabian, or something. In the French film, 1001 Nights, where she wore nothing but some starfish and a seashell. Cause you gotta show some skin to make it in this nasty biz of show. At least that's what they keep telling me. Which is why I'm recording this wearing only some starfish and a seashell. She inspires me. Then she starred in a popular British television series, The Darling Buds of May. But I've never seen an episode of this because I'm an American. She was then in a flop about Christopher Columbus, which I haven't seen, but I guess I should because I'm an American. Then she was in an episode of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. She played the exotic love interest of Young Indy. <laughs> Catherine is so great that she played Catherine the Great in a TV movie. And she snagged a nice role in the comedy Splitting Airs with Eric Idle and Rick Moranis. Hey, what the f*** happened to him? Catherine showed the world that she was able to hold her own amongst all these funny people. Then came the Ewan McGregor surfing movie, Blue Juice. She had a juicy role in it. And then came my first experience with Catherine Zeta-Jones in the film The Phantom. A childhood favorite of mine. Don't ask me why. This was a comic book movie from 1996, before Hollywood really knew what to do with comic book movies. And unfortunately, this swashbuckling adventure was a big failure. As a kid, I was entertained by a purple Billy Zane running through the jungle. It was a mixture of Tarzan, and Indiana Jones, and Batman. And as a 90s kid, I loved it. I consider this her practice run for Zorro. Tie her up. <coughs> and Zorro would actually be her next film after she did the TV movie Titanic in 1996. And this was one whole year before Leo and Kate set sail. Then came The Mask of Zorro, which I just call Zorro. She was cast in this epic after catching the eye of producer Steven Spielberg. I love this swashbuckling adventure, and I love saying swashbuckling. Swashbuckling. <laughs> Catherine is amazing, and she steals the show from Puss in Boots. She was already popular in the UK, but this film made her a movie star in America. It is such an exciting joyride of a movie, one of the last action movies of its kind, actually, before CGI and stuff took over. Just good old honest-to-goodness sword fights and horse chases. I could talk about this movie for hours, but, but let's not. Let's talk about Entrapment. I don't remember the movie, but I do remember the marketing campaign was based entirely around this shot of Catherine bending her way through lasers and strings. Whenever I bend over or step over something in a sexy way, I always call it pulling an entrapment. 
and some people have actually gotten the reference when I tell the joke. Sometimes. But it's funny every time. To me. This is an exciting thriller, and Catherine actually has some interesting old man chemistry with Sean Connery. Hey, what the f*** happened to him? This was the first sign that Catherine had a thing for older men. Catherine was now a bona fide movie star. Good for her. I don't know what you're talking about. What? Then she did the film The Haunting, which got horrible reviews. I remember trying to watch this, and then I think I turned it off because it was so dull. I was not scared. And after the success of The Haunting of Hill House, this film seems even worse now. But it would take more than just a haunted house to stop Catherine Zeta-Jones. Is it Zeta or Zeta? I'm gonna say Zeta. Or Zeta better. Then she took a role in High Fidelity, which is a nice little charming gem of a movie. Everybody loves this one. Or you're, you're supposed to love this movie. That's what I'm told. And then she did Steven Soderbergh's Oscar-winning film Traffic. Catherine held together this incredible ensemble cast, and she was pregnant while filming. And it was actually her idea to include the pregnancy in the film. And this actually added some depth to her character. And Catherine Zeta-Jones' performance in Traffic got her a Golden Globe nomination. Traffic is a masterpiece, pieced together by a master named Steven Soderbergh, who would go on to make pretty much all of Catherine Zeta-Jones' best movies. Except for Ocean's 12, f*** that movie. I love Traffic, Traffic is great. I don't love sitting in Traffic, but I love watching the movie Traffic. And personally, it's one of the first movies that impressed my young mind with its artsy-fartsiness. Before Traffic, I based the quality of a film on the size of its explosions. But then Traffic came out, and I started noticing the techniques of filmmaking in this one. I was like, wow, they're shaking the camera on purpose for dramatic effect. And I thought to myself, this is incredible. Movies are even better than I thought. The cinematography, the color, the pacing, the acting, the direction, the Catherine Zeta-Jones, the Michael Douglas, the Eric Foreman stepping up his drug game. Traffic deserves its 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's Catherine's highest rated film, actually. This could be the last chance to do this. Now get out of the car and shoot him in the head. Just shoot him. While she was dealing with the success of Traffic, she was also getting attention for her love life. Her relationship to Michael Douglas was all over the tabloids, and their high-profile ceremony was called the Wedding of the Year. Mike and Catherine were Hollywood's new it couple. No one can resist Michael Douglas. Then she had to do the romantic comedy thing, with America's Sweethearts, which I thought was, uh, you know, your above-average rom-com. And Catherine, the movie star, plays a movie star. So she got to poke fun at her profession in this one. Just smile and shut up. And then came Chicago, where Catherine has never been better. And this character allowed her to show off all of her skills. Singing, dancing, drama, some comedy, and some sass. Some graceful sass. That jazz. And of course, she won a well-deserved Oscar. And she accepted the award about ready to pop. She was very pregnant with a baby. And her buddy from Entrapment, Sean Connery, was the one who presented her unholy golden idol. Aww, Beth Aths. Chicago was a huge hit. It's the highest grossing Miramax film ever made. And it's all thanks to everybody's favorite human, Harvey Weinstein. So Catherine, you got a baby in your belly and an Oscar in your hand. What are you gonna do next? The answer? Simbad. Do y'all remember Simbad? Because I don't. I remember the posters, but I don't remember the movie. I don't think I saw it. Did you see it? Catherine was just happy to be making a movie that her kids could finally see. And then she became the T-Mobile spokeswoman. She's one of the few people who can sell out and not seem like they sold out. In 2003, she starred in a Coen Brother comedy, Intolerable Cruelty, which is everybody's least favorite Coen Brothers film. But I say we give it another chance. It's actually a very interesting film. Just don't expect a Fargo or a Lebowski from this one. The Coens are best at surprising us, and taking on a low-key romantic comedy was definitely surprising, in a very Coen-like way. Fascinate me.
I remember dragging a large group of friends to the theater on opening day to see this one, and none of these friends cared about cinema in the way that I did, but I was able to convince them that Intolerable Cruelty would be a guaranteed wild ride, based on the previous work of the filmmakers. And unfortunately, these so-called friends trusted me, and they were bored to tears by this film. And they never trusted me again with anything. So for years, for personal reasons, I extremely disliked this film. But like I said before, anyone who isn't a fan of this film should give it a second chance. It's got clever dialogue, interesting characters, great camera work, and there's two or three moments that remind you of what you expect from the Coen brothers. You know, like some funny violence and stuff. The chemistry between George Clooney and Catherine Zeta-Jones makes you feel like you're watching a classic film from the good old days of old. And I'm sure that's what the Coen brothers were homaging in this one. But yeah, just go watch this one again. Go into it knowing what it is. Flush Fargo out of your mind and watch Intolerable Cruelty. I think you'll find it tolerable and not very cruel. Catherine is legit funny in this one. That's another thing to add to her list of skills. She's funny too, fellas. Then she finally got to be directed by her good old pal Steven Spielberg in everybody's least favorite Steven Spielberg movie, The Terminal. But just like Intolerable Cruelty, I say we give this one a second chance. It's not bad, actually. The love story between her and Hanks isn't exactly believable, but it's not bad. The Terminal would be Catherine's last good-reviewed movie for about a decade. Yes! I go New York! <laughs> then came Ocean's 12, which I f***ing hate. I don't like to say hate very much, but I hate this movie. I remember rolling my eyes when they went all meta and had Julia Roberts' character pretend to be the real Julia Roberts because the characters in the movie suddenly realize that Julia Roberts' character looks like Julia Roberts. <sighs> it's cringy, and I hate saying the word cringy, but I hate this movie so much that I'm gonna use a word I hate. Cringy. And of course, none of this is Catherine Zeta-Jones' fault. Ocean's Eleven was fun, but Ocean's Twelve seems like it was just like, hey, uh, we're doing this again. Except there's a number 12, and it's it's Catherine Zeta-Jones this time. And yes, adding Catherine Zeta-Jones to your movie always makes it better, but that's all this Ocean had to offer. And then she surprised us all with a random Zorro sequel, like six years after the original. And I'm always happy to get another Zorro movie, but this one seemed a little too late. Audiences had moved on. Even the biggest Zorro fans were like, well, that's random. It was called The Legend of Zorro, and it got very bad reviews, unfortunately. And the film only earned half as much as the original at the box office. I remember seeing the film and liking it all right, but I don't remember anything about the film. So I guess it's safe to call this one forgettable, because I forgot. When I said that we were never meant to be together, I meant it. Finally, we agree on something. <laughs> She did another romantic comedy called No Reservations, not with Anthony Bourdain. Catherine trained with top chefs to make her movie cooking more believable. Critics did not like this one, but fans enjoyed this romantic comedy. I have not seen this romantic comedy because I am a manly man, and I only watch manly movies. Then KZJ did the Broadway thing, for a bit. In the musical, a little night music. She received rave reviews for her performance on the stage. So while everyone thought she was slipping on the silver screen, she was totally crushing it in the musical theater world, which is actually her first love. Then there was the poorly reviewed Houdini movie, Death Defying Axe. Nobody liked this one, and plus the prestige and the illusionist was still fresh on everybody's mind, so nobody was interested. Speaking of Death Defying Axe, it was around this time that her husband, Michael Douglas, was diagnosed with cancer, and it was very severe. I remember hearing rumors that Michael wasn't going to make it much longer. And I, I don't know if you guys remember, but the world was pretty much preparing for the death of Michael Douglas, which I'm sure was extremely hard on Catherine. It was a long, hard fight, and Michael actually won the battle with his illness. And he went on to be awesome in Ant-Man, as you probably know. But of course, all the stress that comes with the illness really had an impact on poor Catherine. And unfortunately, this led to depression. In 2011, 
Catherine Zeta-Jones shared to the world that she was bipolar. And Zeta-Jones has stated that being open to the public about her inner struggles has actually helped her overcome a lot, even though she never wanted to be the poster child for bipolar disorder and depression. Catherine opening up about her personal life actually helped others see that, you know, even people like Catherine Zeta-Jones can get depressed. And I'm sure that helped somebody somewhere. You know what? I'm sick of talking about it mm -hmm. because I never wanted to be the poster child for this. Right. And I never wanted this to come out publicly. It came out. And so I dealt with it in the best way I could. So she's been focusing more on her health and her happiness rather than her movie career, which is probably the right thing to do. I mean, it's definitely the right thing to do. And around this time, she was also dealing with marriage problems. Unfortunately, the stress of Michael's cancer and Catherine's depression really took a toll on their relationship. And in 2013, Hollywood's it couple separated, but never officially filed for divorce. But luckily, in 2014, Mike and Catherine reconciled and started loving each other again. According to recent reports from trusted sources, they're doing better than ever. Aw, it's so romantic, I guess. And they've actually been married for years, like 20 years, which a 20-year marriage in Hollywood basically counts as a lifelong marriage. Miss Zeta Jones and Mr. Douglas can be considered Hollywood royalty in my opinion, and they deserve their crowns. She's in a lot of great films, she's got an Oscar, and she doesn't need to prove herself to anybody. Nuh-uh, no way, nuh-uh. She should just relax and just be the best Catherine Zeta Jones she can be. You know what? We should all try to be the best Catherine Zeta Jones we can be. Talk about keeping up with the Joneses, am I right? But through all of this, Catherine never gave up on making movies. Another rom com followed, The Rebound. And this romantic comedy I actually have seen, but it seems like I'm one of the only few because it only made like $500,000 at the box office, which is not a lot of money for, for someone of Catherine's caliber. If we're gonna live in the city, we're gonna have to learn to deal with this kind of stuff. Oh. <laughs> Then there was the Steven Soderbergh 3D musical epic extravaganza Cleo, starring Catherine Zeta-Jones as Cleopatra. This wonderful film was Catherine's huge comeback and turned her into the biggest movie star of all time. If the film ever got made, that is. This one is still in development and has been since 2011, and there really hasn't been any development since. So, uh... I don't think this one's gonna happen. I, I don't think they're gonna resurrect this Egyptian queen. Even though Catherine would have been great, I think we should just stop trying to make movies about Cleopatra. You know, and can't, can't we all just agree? I think, isn't, isn't there like a curse or something? Then there was Rock of Ages, which should have been her big musical comeback, but it was not. And even with all those rockin' songs, these tunes still fell flat. Hit me with your best shot. Why don't you hit me with your best shot? She was still stuck. She was stuck in this rom-com limbo. She joined the cast of Playing for Keeps, which is a horrendously unoriginal motion picture. It's like the worst of the worst of the worst of romantic comedies, and there's a lot of worst romantic comedies out there. Many critics called this film embarrassing. 2012 brought the film Lay the Favorite, and this should have been another comeback based on the work of its director, Stephen Frears, but even a good director can make bad movies. And this is one of those bad movies. She was like a magnet for movies that weren't good during this time. Oh, for God's sake, stop sniffing money. And then there was another movie that I completely forgot about, Broken City, a crime drama with Marky Mark and Rusty Crow. Sounded good on paper, but it sucked on celluloid. Or digital, or whatever they used. The dangerous man, Billy. He only knows people that kill people. Then finally came a good movie, Side Effects. She teamed up again with Steven Soderbergh, she should probably keep doing that. And once again, Catherine Zeta-Jones is part of a great ensemble, giving us a kind of Zeta-Jonesy performance that we had been jonesing for for years. The only side effects of this movie were good reviews. I know because it's in the news. That's how I know. Everyone knows. Everyone knows everything, John. But unfortunately, this would be her last good movie, for now. This was followed by Red 2. And just like Ocean's 12, this uninteresting sequel thought that they could get away with simply adding Catherine Zeta-Jones. But no, that didn't work. 
and this film did not live up to the original Red, which a lot of people like. People, you can't just add Catherine Zeta-Jones, you gotta give her something to do. Same goes with this next film. She returned to her homeland to make a World War II comedy, Dad's Army, based on a sitcom. Once again, it got bad reviews. Many complained that they wasted the talent of Catherine Zeta-Jones. What sort of language is that? German, So after a long series of forgettable flops, Catherine returned to television, which nowadays is not exactly a step down. She was in the FX series Feud, and no, she doesn't play one of the leading ladies in this, but many have called Catherine a scene stealer in this series. Stole all those scenes, good for her. I knew she had it in her. Stealing those scenes from those feuding actresses, good job. This was the first sign that a Catherine comeback was completely possible. And she seemed to really enjoy getting into character for her TV movie Cocaine Godmother in 2018. We got to see a different side of Catherine in this one. Catherine's still slowly building up her comeback, and it's working rather nicely if I do say so myself. And yes, myself does say so. And now she stars in Queen America, a dark comedy about the beauty pageant world on Facebook Watch. And I don't watch Facebook Watch, but people who do watch the watch should watch this one. Catherine has seemed to have found a nice little home in Queen America. And I don't plan on watching it, but, but I wish her all the best. Welcome back, Miss Zeta Jones. We missed you. That's why they call it the American dream. She's intelligent, she's talented, she's elegant, she's beautiful on the outside and the inside, gentlemen. And some say that Catherine's beauty and elegance may have actually backfired on her career. Is this actress almost too glamorous? It must be hard to find good roles in which a character can live up to her Catherine Zeta Jonesiness. And apparently it's hard being an aging woman in Hollywood. Many aging actresses have often complained that the good roles slow down as the wrinkles get deeper. But Catherine Zeta-Jones has not aged a day, so I don't think that's her problem. You look at her, she's like 50 and she still looks the same. She is most definitely a vampire. It's the only logical conclusion I can come to. Being a vampire is the only explanation for her ability to freeze time on her face. That or Botox. Or even adrenochrome. I hear that's popular in Hollyweird nowadays. But my main point is that Father Time has been very good to Catherine Zeta-Jones. Probably because she married him. Oh! Oh! Sick burn! Oh! So what the fuck happened to Catherine Zeta-Jones? Well, life happened. And I know that's a stupid, simple answer, but it's true. More important things than movies took over her life. And yes, I know this is blasphemy to say on JoeBlow.com, but there are more important things than movies. Say it with me, children. There are more important things than movies. Except for the first Zora. Nothing's more important than that. So once again, thank you for all the great films and all the great performances, Catherine. No one else compares to you. You're one of a kind. You're the best. You're simply the greatest. You're the cat's meow, the cat's pajamas. Just all the good things and all that jazz.